Hi, uh, my name's Seth. I work at Northwestern University that's in Chicago, um, but I, you know, I work here, work for them at home. Um, if you're the type of person who would like to have your laptop out and like looking at code while I'm talking, um, feel free. All of the code that's on my slides is uh, in this GitHub repository um, called Lens Examples. There's an SPT build file and there's tests. Um, so you should be able to just, just clone it and, uh, and run it. Uh, I'll put that info up again at the end. So, uh, you know, what, what are lenses? What, why do we care? It, it's a little, um, a little hard to like sell the talk in advance. It's like, oh, here's this concept that, I, that you don't know what it is yet, but I'm going I'm to tell you. Um, so, my best attempt in one slide to say, you know, why might you be interested in, um, in lenses is if you're using immutable objects um, in general, but particularly if you're nesting immutable objects uh, inside each other, um, and or um, if you find yourself needing to, uh, to abstract over uh, different fields in those immutable objects. If you have like lots of fields in, in your objects that are similar, you want to write functions that can uh, write one function that can process different fields um, without having to copy and paste the code for each field. Um, lenses may be able to help. Uh, Ed Kmet, who, who's in the audience, um, uh, he, he did already give a, an introduction to Lenses talk um, last year. So yeah, yes, this overlaps a lot with that. Um, but there are some differences. Um, uh, Ed's talk covered lenses and also uh, covered how to combine them with the state monad. Um, and I'm going to talk about lenses only, which will give me more time to just cover the, the basics on lenses. So it's going to be, uh, uh, I think, slower paced and less formal um, talk because I'm going to cover it less. Um, but there is, uh, um, uh, I'm also talking about this library, Shapeless, um, which I didn't mention. Um, and it's, it's one of the libraries that you can to get lenses, so that, that's, uh, that's some content that's new. So this is a talk about functional programming. Everything we're doing is, is, uh, is going to be immutable, um, and it's also about, about Shapeless, this, uh, this library I mentioned. Um, Shapeless is by Miles Saban, uh, not by me. This other library, Scala Z, also provides lenses. Um, what, why didn't I pick it instead of Shapeless for the examples? There's really no, no reason except that I was interested in Shapeless and wanted to find out um, more about it. So th this is not a, an advocacy talk where I you know, convince you that the, that the Shapeless lenses are the, are the, are the best ones. Um, there, are, uh, there are people in the audience who use Scala Z at work, um, and, and so if uh, uh, either during or at the end, if we want to do some compare and contrast, uh, if there are people who have knowledge about scholars to share, that, that would be awesome. Okay, so this is a talk about The example code that I'm going to show, uh, the domain I'm going to use is Turtle Graphics. Um, Turtle Graphics, uh, this is you know, used for teaching programming. Usually you've got turtles, they're, they're moving around on some kind of grid, so the turtle has an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, um, and a heading, and uh, it's got a pen on it that it can either be up, up or down. The turtle, if the turtle moves, uh, and the pen is down, and then it draws a line behind it. So uh, let's implement some turtles. The, the obvious way to do it in Scala is to define a case class um, for the turtles with their x and y coordinate, um, their heading, and the boolean for whether the pen is down. Now, if you want to add some operations to these turtles um, for motion, like uh, go forward, turn right, if we were writing standard imperative code, um, then we would just uh, use a mutation operator like plus equals um, to modify the coordinates in the heading, and those, those methods that move the turtle would return unit. Um, but in order to write that kind of code, we would have to make the um, members of the turtle class bars. Um, but this is, this is functional programming, so uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to go back to our original, um, our original definition of the, uh, where the um, 
there's an implicit val here that these, uh, that these values are immutable. And uh, in order for a turtle to move, um, instead of modifying here, we just make a new one. So you, you can think of this turtle object now uh, not uh, as representing the turtle itself necessarily, but as representing the state of the turtle uh, at a particular point in time. So if the, state of the, if, the, if the turtle moves, it has a new state, we make a new turtle object um, to represent that state. <coughs> and so our methods like right and forward, their return type will now be turtle instead of human. And um, then what, when I use a method like right, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, if I just wrote it by itself, then that value just sort of disappears. So I'm going to have other code around this that hangs onto that value and does something else. Uh, further with the new state. <coughs> to implement a method like forward or right um, in, in Scala, uh, it, it's gotten easier in recent versions. Back in Scala 2, seven days, um, the only way to make a new turtle was through its constructor. So to make a new turtle that was the same as the old one, uh, except with something changed, you had to, you had to repeat everything. You say, oh, new turtle, X core is the same, Y core is the same, heading is different, head down is the same. Um, but in Scala 2.8, they added this uh, method copy that all, uh, that all case classes uh, automatically get. And the copy is defined using uh, named arguments. And the uh, arguments that you don't name default to the same value that the field already had. So now in order to write a method like forward, all we need to, to do is say copy heading equals and give the new, um, give the new value. Okay. Uh, yes, thanks. Yeah, we should fix that. Um, so, so far so good. This code will um, starts getting a little uh, longer if we, um, if we start nesting our, our objects. So suppose we redefine turtle um, so that uh, the position is represented by a point class rather than by separate <coughs> uh, And Imagine that we add a color where the color is itself a class with you know, RGB values or, or whatever. So my turtle objects now have, uh, every turtle object has a point object and a color object nested inside of it. This new form of turtle, uh, it's very easy to create. And if we, in the mutable style, which, um, it, it remains equally easy to update. Um, but the immutable case um, is trickier. Um, Suppose I'm here I'm changing the turtle's x and y coordinates. The x and y coordinates are inside a position object, um, which is immutable, so I need to make a new position object. And then that new position object also needs to be stored in a new <coughs> turtle object. So here I have, I'm calling the copy method twice. I have to copy the position and, um, and copy the turtle that the, the position object is inside. So th this is getting starting to get messier, and um, th that that code that I just showed is, is written in uh, object-oriented style, where the forward method is a is a method on the turtle class. So the compiler is inserting these implicit um, references to the this object form, but it's actually more typical in uh, in functional programming to keep the uh, the operations that uh, operate on your data separate. Um, from the, from the classes that hold the data. So if I'm writing in that style, then I'm, uh, this code gets longer as I have to explicitly uh, say which turtle I'm talking about. So that was two levels. This gets worse and worse if you have uh, additional levels of nesting. Um, and the, the, the difference between the imperative and functional versions gets um, greater and greater. Uh, the imperative version, it really doesn't matter how deep the nesting is. It's easy to update the values. Uh, the functional version, I've, I've got uh, I'll not only lots of copy calls, but I'm also having to repeat the part where I access the, um, where I access the field that I'm trying to get to. Seth, can I ask you a question? Yes. Can you please go two slides back? 
Um, <clears throat> so you, you mentioned uh, in every <coughs> style that we don't usually uh, define these methods as part of the, the domain class itself, but they're, they're separate. Uh, in your experience, where do you keep those methods? Do you just define some object as, as a container for those, or? Um, I would uh, I would have them in the companion object usually. Okay. Um, I, I don't think it I don't think it really matters. Um, I mean the the, the object oriented style right, it's not really it's not really any less functional in that everything here is still is still immutable. So it, it's really just a, a, a style question. I, I would say typically I would, I would put it in um, either in the, the turtle companion object or maybe all of this stuff is already inside some closing scope. And I would just put these in the same scope wherever that is. <coughs> it de definitely stop me with questions because um, we have we have lots of time. Um, I, you know, the, no one asked any questions. This would be under an hour, so there's, there's lots of uh, lots of time to talk. Okay, uh, end level C, we really uh, don't want to write code that looks like this. Um, I'll give one more example of uh, code that is ugly for lack of lenses. Um, and this is from code that I wrote for work, although it's actually also Turtle Graphics. Um, this is from uh, the compiler for our Turtle Graphics language. Uh, and I, I'm not going to explain all this, it's, it's not important. but. Um, the, the, uh, this is an, immu uh, an immutable class with lots of fields, and, uh, and I'm writing code to update it. Um, in the previous version of the code, this was all mutable. I was rewriting it um, to be immutable, and I found myself writing this code. Um, and this is when I got the idea for the talk, because I, I, you know, I, I, I wrote this out. I was like, this is awful. Um, uh, Gee, the, the, this this looks exactly like uh, like something that lenses could uh, could help with. So this um, this code actually illustrates um, both of the problems that can arise when you don't have lenses. Um, one is that I have these nested calls to uh, to copy. Um, here it's just two levels. But this code also also illustrates um, what I mentioned about wanting to abstract over different fields. The two branches of the, the if and the else are basically the same code. There's only one difference, which is whether we're talking about the field called link breeds or whether we're talking about the field that's just called breeds. But without lenses or without something, um, I'm forced to, to do, the, do this copy and paste because I cannot call the copy method on the case class unless I know at compile time which field I'm copying. And in this case, I don't know until uh, I don't know until runtime um, which <coughs> field I'm going to be talking about. <coughs> Part the same type. Yes. Yeah. I mean, typically if you, yeah, in this case, the, the fields are the same type, and so it's especially common that you the need to abstract over similar fields arises if the fields are really similar, having the same type. It's not a, a not a necessary condition for wanting to abstract over fields. Okay, so I will come back to this example and show um, how how it's going to look after. Um, after both of these issues are fixed. The resulting code is not going to be perfect either, but we'll, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about what the what the new issues that we traded off for are going to be. Okay, so th that's all of the preparation. I'm now ready to actually start showing code for lenses. So and in simplest form, th this code is a lens. This is the complete definition. There's nothing else to it. This is all it is. Um, a lens is a, an object that packages together two functions. And uh, those functions are a getter and a setter. So here the, the name, the 
type parameters, the O and the V are supposed to stand for object and value. So I've got an object, I have a value within that object, and this is the, the lens, um, the lens for that value. Um, I'm calling it getter, calling it getter and setter, but actually this is this is the uh, the immutable form of a setter that, that you know that doesn't mutate the um, doesn't mutate the object but actually creates a new one. So that's why the return type of set is O uh, rather than mutate. Yes. I'm going to be provocative. Are lenses just reinventing C++ templates? And if so, are they suffering from performance problems, other things that templates are known for? Um, let me think about that for, for a minute. Um, you can go on. Maybe we should talk later. I don't want to interrupt for a <coughs> Yeah, so here we're, we're using, right, so in, in Scala you don't, instead of templates, you have, you have generic types. Um, and with lenses, we're using we're using generic types. I think you could do the same thing in C plus plus with with, with templates. Uh, but the the the, compar the the comparison of same to same wouldn't be templates to lenses, but templates to generic types. It's it's just a, a different technique for doing for doing generic programming in those two languages. As for performance, uh, I'm. Gonna, I was going to mention that later, but I was only going to say one thing about it. It's just as easy to say now, which is that, um, you know, yes, this stuff is going to be slower. We're, we're, we're putting in extra levels of indirection, extra abstraction. Um, I'm not going to, I haven't measured how much slower this stuff might make your code, but this isn't what I would typically do in code that I really need it to be really fast. Okay, so the lens is uh, is two functions just packaged up together. The getter and the setter. The getter retrieves the current value. Setter makes a new <coughs> object with the new value in it. In addition to that class definition, usually when people define lenses, they also give this this set of lens laws. Um, that number zero, which goes without saying in a, in a, a pure functional language like Haskell, but in Scala, I have to add it. Um, you know that these are, these are pure functions. They should always give, given the same values. They should always get the same uh, output. And then the other laws. This is really just common sense that the functions are behaving as you would expect getters and setters to behave. Which is like, if I set a value and then I ask for it back, I get that value and not something else. Um, it's just just stuff like that. So I, I don't think it's necessary to, to really dwell on this. The third law is a little bit off. Okay, yeah, let, uh, uh, I should get the correction from you uh, after. Okay, so the, the lens, uh, it, it, it represents or contains both of the things that, that a field can do. I mean, that's all a field is. It's, it's something that you, that you can read or set. Um, so, so it's a representation of the field as a value. And I keep putting this definition up because the, this, is, this is really... The whole thing. But how are we going to actually uh, make use of this in code? So, the first lens that we'll create will be uh, the lens for the, the point object within our turtle. Um, so, the type parameters are turtle and point. The turtle is the outer object, point is the inner value. And the two functions that I need to um, pass to the lens constructor to set it up. Um, the, the getter just uh, reads the field, and the setter um, uses copy to, uh, to make an object where, where, the, where the field is changed. Uh, can you write the second lambda there with on the port? Like on the port copy?
sure is whether inserting the named argument counts as doing something. Yeah. If you have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. I'm <laughs> sure. Okay. And if we make another lens, the code is um, very similar. Or the, the only thing, like, if this is a lens for, for updating the x value within a point. If I flip back and forth between these two slides, you can see that uh, it's the same code with only the, the names the, the names changed, the names of the types and the name of the field that's involved. So is that is that implication test during time or can you show how to uh, it? Uh, I'm gonna talk about yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get to like different ways that we might be able not to have to write this over. So, um, for doing nested updates, um, like if I want to update the x a turtle's x coordinate, that x is nested inside the point inside the turtle. How do I get a lens um, for for that situation? Um, I would definitely prefer not to have to write out a you know like this, but nested. But um, fortunately, we can uh, fairly easily write this function compose that will take any two lenses of the appropriate type and, uh, and uh, compose them into a single lens which, uh, which will update the nested value. So to, to, to make a, a, an updater for uh, X and turtle, I just, I just pass the, 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 the position in turtle lens and the X in point lens um, to this function. And uh, here's the full code for that function. Um, there's no, there's nothing real special here. The getter is just <coughs> doing two gets, one after the other, and the setter is uh, is calling both of the setters from the uh, component lenses. Each of the setters has a called copy in it, so this um, results in the nested copy that I that I might have had to write out by hand. <coughs> So once I have that nested lens, now I can use it um, if I have a turtle T0. Um, the syntax is uh, that I put the name of the lens first, set is a method on the lens itself, and then I pass it to the object that I'm updating and the new value. And, and we see that, that um, everything is the same now in T1 except for that, uh, except for the, the, the X that changed the nest two levels. Um, so, uh, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to introduce this library shapeless. Um, does anyone, uh, and, and that, that will feed into the discussion about, uh, about boilerplate and getting rid of it. Are there any other questions just about what we've seen so far? Yes. Uh, is, can you give um, more motivation other than we hate uh, mutable objects? <laughs> um, I, I'm kind of taking as a premise that as a, a premise for all of this, that there are lots of benefits <coughs> to having everything be immutable. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is you know, techniques that will help you achieve that without your code getting, getting ugly. Uh, this question of well, why we care, um, we could talk about that for, for an hour um, or, or like a, a, uh, a, a long time. I don't know if I have a short answer to it, except that um, you know, all, all, for all of the reasons that ever that people always say it's good to, to have things immutable. Stuff that's immutable is um, is thread safe. Um, stuff that's immutable is easy to test. Um, so stuff that uh, uh, pure functions are easy to, easier to reason about because their outputs only depend on their inputs. You don't have to worry about um, about what other state um, what other state uh, it is involved in uh, producing the output. Um, I'm trying to think of something to recommend that's like the, the best thing to, the best thing to read that makes a case for why this sort of program is good. Does anyone want to suggest something actually? The yes. moment you need to. Give back a list of possible changes that you want to make, or if you want to, you know, work with a. You've got a turtle, and you could, you've got eight different directions you can go. 
give me all the new hurdles. You just completely change styles in the imperative. Now you have to copy your hurdle or figure out a way to do it. Whereas before, you know, whereas in the functional style, it's just another hurdle. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. It, to abstract that a little, I think the fundamental issue is separation of concerns. And, you know, why separation of concerns is good is, is also a whole other discussion, right? But in purely functional code, there's a separation of concerns between computation of new values and, um, and what you do with those values. And in, in typical imperative code, those two things are always mixed together. Um, and it's a, that's a, a mix of <coughs> concerns that's so fundamental um, that if you have it, your efforts to <coughs> all sorts of other kinds of separation of concerns are complicated or, or, or stymied. Seth, that was brilliant. I've never heard it said that way so succinctly. Oh, thanks. Write it down. <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look at the video. I don't know what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you another kind of question? Yeah. Is there, are there other ways people use lenses uh, other than the sort of getter setter idea, or is it uh, restricted to just that? Are there other kind of applications? Well, um, I, I'll, I'll skip ahead briefly to... Or, yeah, sorry, we can talk about it later, too. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly show this slide, which is... Um, <laughs> oh, oh, now it's there. there. <laughs> this, this is the, the list of methods that um, lenses in Scala Z provide. Um, so I've shown, you get and, I've shown you get, set, and compose. I'm also going to show you modify. Um, so I'm only going to cover those four. But each one of these, like if you actually read this later in the slides, like each one of these is a sample use. Um, and so I think that's that's the best, uh, that's the closest thing I have to answer for that. Yeah, just to, to speak to that a little bit, um, I have a lens library, and have, actually I have two of them. I wrote, the, I wrote data lens that I replaced it with another library called lens, um, and I actually wrote those. But the, um, the ones I have in Haskell, we have 800 and some odd combinators floating around that are we're working with lenses and some generalization of lenses called different tools and folds and getters and such. So you actually get, like if you're familiar with like, you know, getting and setting, you know, just like on a normal accessor, we have analogs of those that compose in the same way. Um, they don't work so well for the scale, unfortunately. But there are, there are a number of um, applications to lenses in general that exceed the basic. It all comes down to getting it. What I'm saying is that this is the basic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a whole bunch of I mean, the, the basic lens thing is so is so small, right? That, mm -hmm. that um, it, it's uh, you know it's 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 useful for almost anything where you have fields. Um, it, it, it's, it's it's so small that it's that general. I was. Um, oh, and, any more questions just on the, the uh, this hand roll? Yes. Yes. Um, for example, like if you have two tool objects, you often have change listeners. For example, I want to watch whether the two are the this one. But <coughs> if you throw away the whole hierarchy and recreate it, where would you choose the listeners to? Huh. I, I can't say that I've. Run that I've experienced that in my own code, where I had to, where I, I had listener code that I replaced <coughs> with a, a pure functional equivalent. So, yeah, I, I can't improvise an answer to that. I don't know if anyone else wants to try. I think you could. Um, what are you listening for? Are you listening for mutations of? This of the, well, for the example, object. I want. Uh, I have uh, some code that redraws the turtle and needs to know whether it has moved or something like that, or whether it has uh, reached the corner, the, the border of the screen, or something like that. Or okay. There are other ways to yeah. follow solutions to those kinds of yeah. problems and using listeners, and you would almost certainly choose. One of those other ways, if you were writing the function. Yeah, you had structured the program so that that wasn't a thought you had, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, so, a
abandoning this, uh, <coughs> this uh, handwritten code now, I'll start talking about this library shapeless. Uh, if you want to use shapeless in your own code, um, th this is the, the magic uh, formula that you drop into your SBT build. And uh, you, you do these imports. Uh, you import the basic shapeless stuff, you import uh, the stuff in the lens object, and then um, also these, these uh, uh, natural number types, which the lens, uh, lens stuff uses. And then you're ready to go. In order for shapeless to create lenses for you, um, first you need to, to tell it um, about the uh, classes that you're going to be using. So I'll come back and explain uh, a few slides later what this is actually doing. But for now, it's just some, some boilerplate saying, hey, I, I'm going to want some lenses on these three classes. <coughs> you wrote out the types of those values you just defined. How long would they be? Um, let, let's see, the uh, apply and unapply uh, functions both have one type parameter for every field. So I think the, the types would have, you would see each field, uh, you would see each field appear twice in the arguments. And then in the resulting H list, there would be, there would be one type parameter for a field. Uh, I'll get back to it. Uh, what, what H list is. Excuse me? Yeah. Um, you, for some reason in my head, I have, I think that uh, Scala has like a maximum of 22 generic parameters or something like that. Is that, am I making that up? Do, do you know if there's like some smallish max cap for the number of generic parameters? Like um, the, the limit of 22 is, is um, not a limit on the number of type parameters, but it's a limit on the size, the size of tuples and case classes. Oh, it's um, I don't think there's any limit on the on the number of type parameters that I'm aware of. Uh, there is one. Is there? Yeah. Is it uh, very it's, high? It's entirely high. <coughs> if you have more than 95 kilobytes of type information in your type, <laughs> then, then the then Scala's equal crash. Because there is enough room in the street literals to store it. Do you have any idea how many type parameters it equals 95k? A bunch. <laughs> <laughs> so this probably puts it up about to about 48,000. So. That's a little bit of so we can bring it down. <laughs> Okay, so I've told uh, Shapeless about my classes, and now to actually make the lenses, uh, it looks like this. The, um, it, it's a bit unfortunate, but I have to refer to the field number, to the fields by, by number, um, and how they're defined. So, uh, the, the x inside point, inside turtle, is the zero, it's the zero with field and point, point is the zero with field and turtle, y is, you know, field number one. And that is building the, basically the exact same uh, lenses that, that that code that I showed before um, would make. And the calling sequence is, is, uh, is the same way. To, to let you call the setter, you put the lens first. Um, oh, there's, there's a, a slight difference here, which is that it's two parameter lists instead of one. In, in my code, I, I had a comma instead of um, starting the, uh, instead of putting the, the value being set in a separate parameter. I'm not quite sure why Miles um, chose to do it that way. But basically the same. And uh, Shapeless provides uh, another method called modify, um, which I could have added to my, um, to, to my code, but, um, but, but I didn't. Modify uh, combines get and set. Um, it takes an object, and it takes a, a function that transforms a value. So it calls the getter pulls the value out, runs the value through the function, and then takes the resulting value and stores, um, stores it back in the same location. So th this is useful in a function like forward, where the turtle's new x-coordinate and y-coordinate are um, 
you know, depend on, on what the old values were. So uh, I can compute the new coordinates by running them through a function that adds the, uh, that adds the appropriate value on. So that often, uh, that often uh, makes code that um, uses both get and set shorter. Another example of using modify, um, I've talked about um, sometimes needing to abstract over fields. Um, suppose we want to abstract over x and y and write a function that, that can increment either the x or y coordinate of a turtle. Um, how would I write that function without repeating the code for both x and y? Um, so I would have increment take a lens itself as an argument, um, since these are these are values that we can sling around just like uh, just like other values, and then increment would use that lens to um, and, and pass a, an incrementing function to. So here, I mean, the, the sample calls, I, I've, I've written in which lens I'm using, but I could delay that decision until runtime, um, which is something that I, that I couldn't do without, um, uh, if I were just using the copy. Um, I showed you this code earlier um, that I wrote at work, and I, I promised that I'd show how it looks with lenses. <coughs> Um, and it actually condenses down a lot. Um, uh, this is slightly unfair, right? Because this is assuming that <coughs> I have already set, set up the, len the lenses for, for these classes, right? So if I if this was the only piece of code I were trying to shorten, then I wouldn't have uh, I, I wouldn't have, have saved much. But yeah, if I were going to be using those lenses over and over again, uh, then I'd really be saving a lot. So here I've avoided the copy and paste. Um, I, I can just uh, um, first decide which lens I'm using, and then whichever it is, you know, which I won't know until runtime, call set, and the uh, um, nesting of the lenses takes care of avoiding that um, that nesting problem. So, uh, so mission accomplished there. That's a good question. Yes. Is there a reason to not push that into the lens itself and to say sort of? With the lens, uh, you know, it's given a, a program and given some value, and the lens is going to handle the attraction of which where to set it. Um, you, you could certainly do that. The the question, I guess, you, you would do that if you were always going to use the lens in that particular way. Yeah. But if you had other uses for it, you might prefer to 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 leave it generic. So uh, shapeless gives you get and set, compose, modify. It also gives you this tilde operator, which lets you compose um, lenses into into lenses on tuples. Um, if I want to update, read, or update um, uh, item, uh, objects that are stored in, uh, in tuples. And then I already showed the slide of all the other stuff that um, that you get if you use um, if you use policy. Okay, so uh, uh, how is Shapeless able to do this? This code that I showed, where you um, sort of register your your class with um, with, with Shapeless. Um, here, the the ISO is short for isomorphism. I, isomorphism is a, a two-way mapping. Um, so here, it's a two-way mapping between uh, between your class, like Turtle, and a, a class that um, Shapeless uses internally called hlist. Um, th this part of the talk, by the way, this is going to be fairly condensed, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best <coughs> to make this clear without going on long about it, too long about it, but th this subject of hlist would, could be like a whole talk to itself. So, uh, so shapeless works by, uh, anytime you do something with a case class, it internally copies it to an hlist, manipulates it as an hlist, and then when it's done, copies it back out to an instance of your, of your case class. So in order to do that, um, in order to uh, go in the up direction, in order to, if it has an H list and it needs to construct a turtle, then it needs to have the constructor for the turtle. And that's what turtle.apply is. 
right? That's, um, we're just taking the uh, apply method on the turtle companion object, which is what we normally use to construct uh, case class, and we ask for that as a function value. Uh, so that gives shapeless the constructor it needs to go in the up direction. And then uh, unapply, unapply is the, um, is the automatically generated method on case classes that's used during pattern matching. So uh, it's like a, the unapply is like a deconstructor for your object. It takes the object as input, it splits it up into its component, uh, component parts and, and, give, and gives them back um, as separate values. So that's how, um, that's how Shapeless is able to, to get the values. It's like all of the getters at once in one function. It is one way you could think of, think of unapply. So that's, so that's how Shapeless is able to get all the values out in order to make one of these H-list things. Okay, so what, what is an H-list? Um, if you know Scala, then you are familiar with lists and you're familiar with tuples. Um, and uh, H-list kind of combines the advantages of, uh, of lists and, and tuples in a single structure. The big advantage of a list is that uh, its length can vary, right? Um, whereas a tuple, the uh, size of it uh, has to be known at compile time. So in the Scala standard library, there are classes called tuple 2, tuple 3, tuple 4, tuple 5, going all the way up to tuple 22, where it stops um, for, you know, for no reason that anyone, uh, anyone knows, as, as far as I know. Um, and those classes, uh, they don't really have anything to, to do with each other. They're separate classes. Um, Scala doesn't know that, you know, I, I could throw away the first element in a tuple 3 and that would give me a tuple 2 back. Um, <coughs> it's just like the, the 2 tuple and 3 tuple are just kind of separate worlds. So tuples don't let you, um, you know, the, the way, way to say that is, is that tuples don't let you abstract over arity. I can't write a single function that um, processes tuples of any length. Um, or at least I can't do it in a type safe way. Um, you can do it if you're willing to, to describe type safety. Um, but um, uh, you know, we, we prefer to do things in a, in a type safe way when possible. And then the problem with lists, um, uh, <coughs> the problem with lists is that the compiler doesn't know um, uh, specific types for each element in the list. So if I if I like have a if I have a dog and a cat and I put them in the same list, I'm going to end up with like list animal. And even if I before I put them in the list, the compiler may have known that, that the types were dog and cat. But once they're in the list, that information is lost, um, at least lost at, at compile time. And all I all I know anymore is that the is that the stuff in the list is, is all animals of one sort or another. So H list lifts, lifts that restriction and lets you have a, a, a list of multiple items, and the, and the, but the type of each item can be completely different if you want, it, and the compiler will keep track of all of them individually. So uh, something like an H list is exactly what you need to write code that works on all case classes, no matter how many fields they have, no matter what types of the fields are. Um, if I represent that, that case class as an H list, then the compiler knows um, the compiler knows all those types, but I don't have to write the same code for length two, length three, and four um, the way I would with two lists. Is there restriction on the length of the H list? Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess would be that the uh, only limit would be um, the limit on the number of type parameters that, that you know, Stephen's question. Right. Um, but I don't know that for sure. In, in practice, there's like practical limits on how much the compiler will infer. Yeah, it, uh, there's, it's not like the limit with the number of type parameters. Okay, so that, that's about as much as, as, um, as I'm going to say about HList. If you're interested in uh, learning more about it, at the end of the talk, I will show some um, links to uh, Miles' talk about Shapeless, and also uh, I'll give a link to 
Mark's blog posts um, about his ageless code. The, 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 the key idea is, is that it allows you to um, handle things of, of different arity, of different numbers of arguments um, in, a, in a generic way that's also type safe. So that's what the H list in H list isomorphism is. And then, um, oh, well, I, I didn't put the uh, code back up that makes the lenses. Um, but you can, you, you can now, okay, I can go back to that. So, uh, where was it? <coughs> oh, well, well, you remember what, when you made the lenses, you would say, I want field zero, field one. Um, that's because the reason that it works that way is that the the H list stuff um, knows the type, it knows how many fields there are, and it knows the type of each field, but doesn't know what the field is called. Um, and so, in order to have it know the names, Miles would have had to do something else involving reflection or macros or something. Uh, it, it wouldn't be able to do that with just ordinary Scala code. Okay, um, so th this is now, we're moving into kind of the end of the talk where it's like I've shown you all the, all the code that I'm going to show, show you and, and I'm going to talk about options and, and concerns and future changes and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so, boilerplate, this was Josh's question. Um, uh, how bad is it? Um, is there anything that we can do to get rid of it? Um, we, we saw that shapeless makes it makes it less, but um, you know I, I still do have to uh, to write out a bunch of repetitive code to establish the lenses. Um, the, the one thing that, that I'll say in defense of this is that at least the boilerplate is um, in the definition. Um, it, you know, like where I define my turtles, I would also define my lenses in that same place. And that boilerplate is not going to end up causing a lot of repetition in the client code, the code, the code that, that uses it. So, you know, definition site repetition is better than, than use site repetition. Um, uh, oh, remedies for boilerplate. Um, uh, I don't think that the macros that are shipping in Scala 2.10 would help with this. But um, the people working on macros at EP, EP, EPFL and TypeSafe are, you know, already talking about new, more powerful macro systems for future versions of Scala. So it's possible that macros will save the day on this um, at some point. Um, you could uh, you could generate these lenses using a compiler plugin, and um, actually, this guy Gerald Seitz has written such a plugin. It's called Lens. Um, it, it works with Scala, Scala Z and not with Shapeless. Um, I haven't looked at it too closely, but there's the, the link if you want to check it out. And then the other thing that you might do is just write a, a source code generator to uh, generate these lenses for you. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, repetitive code, so I can just write, write code that, that writes that out. Um, I would say the good news on that is that if you want to add source generation to your SBT build, um, that's actually uh, pretty easy in the uh, latest versions of SBT. Uh, this is an example. This is all you would have to need. Uh, this is all you would need to add to the build um, to add a source generator that generates this this one line. Um, so ideally, I would have done this for lenses and. and added it to the GitHub repo, but I haven't done that. I still may, uh, I still might get to that. So um, yeah, consider consider source generation, particularly if you uh, uh, if you only use SBT to build your build your code. This might complicate your life more if you're using an IDE. Um, Okay, so there's still some boilerplate. Um, you may consider the, the syntax for using lenses um, to be unnatural. I mean, it is certainly unfamiliar, right? So in, in this code, like, uh, 
<coughs> hurdle x dot set t zero three. Um, I mean, this looks different than the than the type of code um, uh, that we're used to writing. So, how much you care about that? Um, you just have to weigh that against what you think the value of um, having everything be immutable be, um, and that's that's your own your own judgment call. And then performance, as I mentioned earlier, yes, definitely, you know, adding more levels of abstraction is going to is going to slow your code down. Um, I haven't been it. If you're interested in using lenses just by themselves, um, without having to pull in a whole library, um, you might use the uh, the code in my repo. Um, you might look at the code that um, that Ed has in his talk. I looked at Shapeless to try and see if I could like just extract only the parts that I needed to to do lenses, and uh, I got lost really fast. It was like, oh, lens, to, to do lenses, you need HLIS. And then when I saw how he, how he implemented HLIS, it's like tied to all this other stuff. So it doesn't appear to me that that is, well, it's certainly not easy. Um, I mean, it must be, must be possible, but um, not, not easy. I, I don't think it would be easier, easy either in Scholasy. Um, Covered that, <coughs> that. Uh, talked about this stuff. Uh, I don't know that much about Scala Z, so if anyone is interested, uh, maybe some people in the audience could answer questions about it um, at the end. So the advantage you get are set or combination. Most yeah. Exactly. I mean, so it doesn't have that cool auto generate by ISO to H list thing. So, well, there's also like, there's, I think they still have um, ones that run. I think it's still you get and you said I think it's okay. And they both have partial lenses. Well the ones that were Marcella Z were also a pair of their inside. They were not fused. You could perform more for them. Yeah, but I, I think seven is different. Okay. So there's there's partial lenses. Um, and there's lens T, which I'm not sure about. And and all lenses can run in one that you give it. If anyone wants um, to investigate what the same stuff looks like in Scala Z7, um, there is a blog post by Eugene Yokota. Um, uh, it's a whole series called Learning Scala Z, and day 11 is about lenses. And he uh, saw an earlier version of, of these slides um, that I just went through, and so he took the same example. So he goes through the same turtle example. Um, does it first with uh, just with lenses, and then does it again using lenses combined with the stage one head um, in much the same way that, um, that Ed did in his talk. Um, so I haven't done it yet, but I do intend to take that code and add it to my to the, uh, to the GitHub, GitHub repo. Um, but it's all, it's all right there in the blog post. Um, I'll just <coughs> quickly run through some other uh, further reading and viewing. Um, Ed's talk is still, uh, from last year, is uh, still on covering lenses and the state monad. It's on YouTube. Um, the lenses paper that people seem to recommend most often is this paper. It's a, a greatly different concept. Oh, no. Really? It has absolutely nothing to do with this idea. Okay. Sadly, the, the lenses that they're talking about there look, are, because are, are an occasional thing. It has to do with the fact that there's a square back surrounding a um, uh, an actual paren, and it looks like a bracket. It looks like a, con a concave lens. Okay. It, it, it's actually, it, it's everybody likes to point to it, but it absolutely okay. nothing to do with this idea. All right, I've, 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 re I've repeated the error from uh, from some source. Miles recommended um, uh, this paper by Benjamin Pierce, um, which is an older paper um, called Combinators for Bidirectional Tree Transformations. Um, it's work that was done in Oak Hamel. So there's a link on that. Um, Miles has a talk on Shapeless that you might have seen at the uh, at, uh, here in Boston at the Scholar Symposium earlier this year. And I mentioned this series of blog posts by Mark Hera, who's here. Um, the whole second half of the series is about H-List and a, a related concept uh, K-List. That's it. I have any further questions?
Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the syntax using lenses was maybe a little awkward if you were used to the more imperative style. But um, people are fond of making embedded DSLs in Scala. I wonder if there's some, some possible way to marry a friendlier syntax using some kind of DSL with, with lenses. Um. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good idea. I haven't considered that. Yeah, I, <coughs> I did bother to point your example to my Haskell lens library, which actually can show oh, me if you would like. Awesome. Uh, you yeah, know, I can do it. After, I can show people afterwards or whatever. Scala so lenses have lots of DSL operators. Yeah. For doing stuff like the thing to convert to a unqualified assignment. If you, if you want to read it as a, if you want to use it as a getter, you just yeah. Like use modify it. is like percent equals like that. And colon that equals. You give it a you give it a anamorphism, and it will or that's set. To, a, to a state transform. And what I want to show. It. Sure, why not? Okay. I mean, like I said, I mean, I have that. No, it's very cool. I'm 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 actually really glad that there's um, uh, there's people here to cover the the scholarly side of the story. All right, so let's see if this works. So um, I, I just banged this out when I pulled down the, the lens again. Just now. Uh, hopefully I can get this to, do you know if there's a quick key combination to get this thing to mirror? It used to be kind of function about the, sorry. Displays, maybe mirroring. Hello. All right, let's see if I can get this down to work. Slightly less going up from like 25 to 60 places or something. A little smaller. All right. Um, <coughs> all right. So for his terminal module, he had a he had a dead type for points, which had an x and a y coordinate. I'm sorry, that probably got a little too small. Yeah, so he has an x and a y coordinate. Now in in Haskell, uh, this is just using the actual record syntax to create. Um, a data type point that you can, you have two functions named underscore x and underscore y to get up get them out, and the reason I put the underscore in there is because I have this template Haskell function named make classy. There's also a make lenses that will go through a record type and look for all the field names that start with underscores, rip the underscore off, and make a lens with that same name. Would it be fair to say that template Haskell is uh, is your macros? Like macros, macros in yes. So if I go through and I said I want to point one two, that gives me a, a a point I can use, and then I can use caret dot to access its X member. Right? Caret dot is a combinator from control that lens, my, my lens lever. Okay, and if we wanted to update, we could say, hey, update the X coordinate, set it to 10 inside of point. And maybe this is a little clearer if I say, if I flip this around. So in the first guy, for the first, there, uh, first thing I'm doing x dot uh, tilde. So it's like dot equals. Um, I use equals for the operations that work on state in your state format. I use tilde for something that, that works more functionally, like the setter that um, Seth was using earlier. Um, so here we're saying um, make a function and then apply to the argument, or we're saying here's the value and there's the function I want to apply to it. The, the, the oh, that sign is, is kind of apply this function. Um, and it's nice because it, it, it reads a little more imperative stuff. Um, So I can make up. So this default class is just saying that there's a default definition for a point, and um, it's x and y equals zero. Okay, we can also make a similar thing for color. We can, you know, the RGB <coughs> is the same example. Um, making making something classy means that um, it's possible to, if you have something that has a point, it's possible to directly access the members of point without having to compose the lenses the way. Seth was doing earlier, where he was getting the point and then getting his x. Um, I'll show an, exa an example in a minute where I actually have the turtle just has an x coordinate 
and a whiteboard. And you can just so use the, the directly. The stuff you did with template hash flow knows how to compose the lenses? Yes. So if we look at the, not my IRC client, one of these other windows. Yeah, so if I look at the type of x, this is actually a pretty horrible looking thing. It's actually a function from a function to a function. <laughs> but what, what it says is, is if you have anything that has a point, you can use that as the source of the of, the, of this lens. And so you can read and write too. Cool. The, the types of portion that come out a little hideous on the page. So we can say, you know, we have colors and we have turtles. Turtles have points. They have a point for their current location. They have a color. They have a heading. And they have whether or not the pen is down. And this is also, we make classy just like we did before. We give it a default definition. So the turtle has a point that starts out at 0, 0. It has a color which starts out black. It has a heading which starts out <coughs> uh, 0. So I guess it's straight up. Um, and then we have a pen down flag, which is, you know, we start at false. And we can say that a turtle has a point. And so in order to do that, I have to come up with a lens to notice how to get a point out of a turtle. Well, fortunately, I already have one. I just built one named T-point. So I can just directly define this, and then the, the lenses for X and Y actually pre-compose the use of the point function out of the, you know, they, they basically, they use the point lens, and then they go get the X field out of it. It has point as a type class? Yes, has point is the type class that was built by Make Classy. Make Classy will go through and build a type class for you, make accessors for all the, the members of the record, pre-compose the lens onto all, yeah, it does all of it for you. And then we can go through and we can define something like the forward combinator that Seth used earlier, which was, uh, he said something like, given forward, given a delta and a turtle, I want to take my turtle and I want to modify my Y value. And in this case, he was adding, I have a, cute little infix combinator that I can use. So you know, this is like plus equals. So I was saying y plus equals the delta that I want to go plus the cosine of the heading of my correct turtle. And then I want to modify my x by adding my delta times my sine of my head. OK, and we can go through and we can turn. Because th th this, is a, this, this is a function that takes three parameters. It takes the the heading, or what I want to do, or the, the lens, what I want to add to it, and then what I'm looking for here. So that's the turtle to turtle that I got out of this. So I didn't actually name the fact that I'm taking a turtle and then I'm applying this resulting function <coughs> to a turtle. It just, it just works, it carries for me. So we've now got forward, turn, and then a couple of other like up and down kind of combinators. And I can use those one of these windows, which I keep using. Say, give me a default turtle. Uh, go forward um, 10 units. And we can see that this guy now has a y equal to 10. And maybe I want to turn 90 degrees and go forward another five. And so that actually kind of looks like a little bit of a logo-ish vocabulary for moving around. Okay. <laughs> and I can put the pen down and what? So if you attack a monad on there for logging the segments of what you drew while the pen was down, you pretty much have a logo. That was that was just my um, spin on on Seth's demo. But I figured the this this showcased a pretty nice little DSL for working with lenses. The, you know, the, this feels like saying plus equals. You know? And if this was actually the state, if you were working with some state action for a turtle, where you just had your state there, to hijack my example. That would be how it would work in a monadic setting. So that's all I got. <laughs> cool.
And the plus equals actually becomes the, the notion that you're used to from an imperative. Right. Right. Well, you, you should send me, I can either add a, a link to this or just add the code directly to my, to my repo afterwards. Sure. Whichever you All right. We'll do. Sorry. So I, I think you could put, you could do something similar in Scala. My only um, you know concern about it would, would be is you you can by using operators you can put things back in the order that you wanted. But now you have funny symbols, um, and the funny symbols is usually fine as long as you're only using one set of them in particular code. But it's a train wreck if like you're trying to you're trying to use two libraries at once. Uh, uh, so it's you know more trade-offs. All right, let's let's run a catalyst.